educational system adequately preparing students for life after school? Definitely not. Definitely not. Um, look, we, we have had all these um, concerns raised over um, a long time. I mean, if I can take you through history, that in 1995, it's, it's, it's more like, a, like going back in time, but in 1995, I wrote and published a paper with a colleague at the University of Fort Hare, mm -hmm. who was then dean of the, the Faculty of, of, of Agriculture. We titled it Problems of Learning Among First-Year Students in South African Universities. And we, we were very clear, we ran a study and it was clear that our students are hampered largely by what we call then underpreparedness. And um, subsequent to that, people like the late Professor Wally Morrow took the issue up and made very clear statements that our students lack, and this is an expression that he used, mm -hmm. that our students lack epistemological access, which means they do not have access to those elements of knowledge mm -hmm. that are necessary for the students, first of all, to make it in a university and to make it in the, in the world of work. Mm. Have we improved since then? I mean, you are talking 1995 when I published my paper. Professor Moro published his paper, I think, a year before mine. Now, we are talking 2014, mm -hmm. we are still dealing with the same problems that I researched almost 15 years ago. So something is really wrong. We are not preparing our, our, our learners for university. Mm -hmm. I used to be a principal, and I can tell you, the things that I used to, to manage and the things that used to be put on me as a principal under pressure by the education authorities was to prepare children to pass the exam. Absolutely. Now, children passing the exams is not the same as children getting into the exam, coming out educated enough to stand on their own feet when they get to university. Mm -hmm. That is the dilemma. Most schools still chase results. So if a school gets 70%, that's fine. The principal and the education district officers will tick. The bottom line is, does that 75% that the student get, does it translate to knowledge that the student can carry with them into higher education? Invariably, that's mm -hmm. not the case. Professor Jonathan Janssen, when he was still the, the dean of the College of, of the Faculty of Education at the University of Pretoria, ran what are called entrance tests. A lot of students that had come with excellent, excellent symbols, they failed the, extent, the, the entrance test, which was a, a, an indication that there is something wrong in what schools do and what universities expect. Mm -hmm. There's also something wrong with what schools do and what the world of work expects. So we need to bridge that gap. Mm, mm, mm. Nikki, let's talk about um, how there was much upheaval when uh, the department actually lowered the pass rate to below 50%. Does that mean that we don't have enough faith in our learners to say, look, they can produce um, A-plus results? I think what's relevant is 50% of what or 30% mm -hmm. of True. what. And that's something that we're not looking at as much as we need to. Mm -hmm. um, as the professor said, schools are chasing results. Um, you know, it's it's... A wonderful it's thing to say we've had over a 90% pass, pass rate or 100% mm. pass rate, which is all very well, but we need to look at what we're actually teaching our learners. Mm -hmm. um, and, and in that regard, you know, we need to mention the, the Department of Basic Education's draft policy on mm -hmm. HIV, TB and STIs in schools. Those kinds of things I don't believe are being taught um, in depth enough mm -hmm. and broadly enough across schools. Mm -hmm. um, but again, referring to the SACMEC report, referring to the annual national assessments, it's clear that we're not teaching our learners the literacy and numeracy skills that they need mm -hmm. um, and that they finish school, come out with a qualification of matric and what can they actually do with it? Absolutely. All right, now I want to ask this to you for both you and the professor. Um, I have stats here. The USA is currently at 77% uh, pass rate. The UK at 87%. Japan is at 93 Now, South Africa is somewhere by the 77% bracket. Why are we not respecting our education enough or um, giving it that much credit? Because a lot of people would rather go in school uh, overseas and then come back and get a job uh, and, and train in South Africa? I think that there are a number of factors. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, I don't think it's fair to say that we're not respecting education enough. If we mm -hmm. look at the, the budget that's allocated to basic education, education does get the biggest piece of the pie. Mm -hmm. 
I don't believe that education is being prioritized in the way that it needs to be. But, mm -hmm. but there, I think what we need to look at is the design of the education system. Absolutely. The system in South Africa is designed to be unequal and to produce learners that cannot realize their and potential. Thank you very much for raising that point, Nikki. I wanted to ask, um, is also the accessibility to student funding uh, another major problem? If you can also just put that in your answer as well. <laughs> I think it is. And I think... Um, you know, the, the practicalities of systems need mm -hmm. to be taken into account. <laughs> Just to give you an example, the introduction by the Department of Basic Education of the no-fee system, mm -hmm. I think was a very good initiative, except that that needs to come hand in hand with adequate funding from the Department of Education for the day-to-day -day running of schools. Mm. And unfortunately, what we're seeing is that schools are not getting everything that they're entitled to from the department, regardless of whether that's actually sufficient for mm. what they need. Mm. <coughs> schools are then charging almost a de facto school fee to learners who cannot afford to pay anything for their education. And learners are then being excluded from school in that way. Mm -hmm. And so I think we need to look at, at practical things like that. How do we actually make sure that a no-fee school operates as well as, as a fee-paying fee school in a very school. wealthy area, mm. that learners have the same level of access to education and, and that they come out on an even playing field. Mm, mm. Now, Professor, your take on the fact that uh, we, we're competing USA 77%, UK 87%, and of course Japan unbeatably at uh, 93%, where are we losing credibility of our education system or the education department? It's on quality. The issue, first of all, is on quality. Um, the argument doing the rounds now is, should we actually be fussing about whether tomorrow we are going to get 75% or what? Mm -hmm. Because the bottom line is, even if we were to get 80%, serious questions need to be asked. And as, as your, 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 your guest there puts it, I, I actually like her comment. 75% of what? We should be in a position to separate between quantity and quality. Mm. So that when we put the number up and we say this year we have improved, we have 75% or 76% or whatever the case it may be, we need to be asking ourselves whether does that number tell us anything about what our learners know, what mm. our learners are capable of. Until we can deal with that, that number simply becomes an insignificant mirage. And I think the, the rest of the countries that you mentioned um, education is, 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 is a political act always. I mean, um, mm. at a particular level, a minister who doesn't deliver in terms of providing that quantitative number mm -hmm. that the political uh, executives want usually gets a chop. So we are straddling between how to balance between the politics and what is needed to be done. Mm. I'm an educator, so I, I feel it's important that we begin to focus attention on the quality. I spoke Absolutely. about epistemology, knowledge. What is it that we do? When Mary Metcalf was, um, I think, the, the head of the school at VETS, she spoke about going back to the basics. Mm. That's something that we need to talk about. We need Professor. to be asking ourselves whether... Professor, yes. very quickly, if I can just get in there, why does uh, different subjects actually have a different pass rate or pass mark average? What does that mean? <laughs> That's... That is, that is a political thing. Ask the Minister of Education. The Minister of Education has done that. I can't answer it. I see it in the policy documents, and it baffles me. It really baffles me. Um, earlier on, there was a mention in the studio of a pass rate of 50%. Mm -hmm. I think um, if you look at what these other countries do, whether you are talking about the African continent or you're talking about Europe mm -hmm. or you're talking about America, there is, there is an agreed understanding that for you to pass a subject, you have to get at least 50% of what you are asked. Yes. What that means is that, and I want to use a simple analogy, if I design a syllabus and I say to a teacher, I'm giving you 100 points that I want you to go into a class over the year and get the students to study, at the end of this year, I wanted to test the students and make sure that they pass at least 50% of the points that I ask you to study. These points are what you call curriculum. Absolutely. Curriculum is what ought to be known, mm. what will be useful to society, what makes a student a worthwhile person in society. Now, if our students can only pass 35% of the 100 things that we prepare them to pass, we cannot sit here and celebrate and say, we have done well. Something mm. is really wrong. All right. Nikki, what is your take on that? Different pass rates for, for, for different subjects? 
Is it really a political issue? I agree that it's you know it's not something that that I'm qualified to comment on. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know what the motivation behind that is. Mm -hmm. um, you know, unfortunately, it's it's not something I can add very much to. All right, but Nikki, let's talk about um, the year starting now. What would you hope to see um, changes, like drastic changes, within the department as the year kicks off? A number of issues, mm -hmm. um, and I'm talking about both the National Department of Basic Education and the nine provincial education departments. Mm -hmm. We need to see increased accountability for failures mm -hmm. um, in education. We need to see um, increased responsiveness to complaints that come up. Mm -hmm. um, for example, we do quite a lot of work in Limpopo province, and it's the rainy season at the moment, mm -hmm. and so roofs are falling off schools or being blown off schools at an alarming rate. Mm -hmm. And the Department of Education in Limpopo is not responding to those complaints as quickly as, as they should be doing. Mm -hmm. um, it's impossible to realize the right to basic education in a school that doesn't have a roof, mm -hmm. um, you know, where school is canceled in rainy weather that kind Absolutely. of thing. So yes. I think we need to improve things like infrastructure. We need to make sure that teachers are appointed. We need to make sure the textbooks are delivered. But we also need to address those underlying issues of responsiveness, accountability, corruption, mm. proper budgeting. Um, we need a more transparent budget Absolutely. and we need to know how the money is being spent and what steps are being taken to ensure that it is being spent adequately. All right. And Professor, very quickly, in your views, what could be amicable, be amicable solutions to these problems? I, I think Nikki hit the button. One of the things that I was going to say is, is about provision of resources. I mean, we, mm -hmm. have, we have gone past the issue of books, but has the issue of books really died? I don't think so. I think there are some schools that still don't receive books on time. We need to deal with infrastructure. I mean, there are, there are children in the provinces who still study under trees. We are a rich country. We need to provide those countries, those, those provinces with schools. A small country like Lesotho, for example, has done a massive, massive infrastructure initiative. They have built schools in rural, most remote areas. They have provided the infrastructures for teachers to work in. We need to look into the issue of, of, of accountability. Nikki raises mm. an issue of accountability. I want to be precise here. Our education is at the moment paralyzed by union power. And union power is a political issue. The unions control education. I say it without reservation. The unions control the education districts. The unions control how principals are appointed. Mm -hmm. The unions are basically a law unto themselves. We need to come back and separate unions as entities that fight for teachers' rights and unions as entities that represent teachers who have to go into the classes and do work. Mm. But we need to deal with the issue of teacher production. Our higher education institutions, I teach at UNISA, and UNISA is implicated in that too. Mm. I'm not trying to absolve it. Higher education institutions are producing a less number of teachers that are required. At the moment, the Department of Education will acknowledge that. The higher education institutions are producing less than 10,000 teachers a year. Mm -hmm. We need in excess of 20,000 teachers, newly graduated teachers, injected into the system All right, in okay. order for our education system to function optimally. Thank we are you, not there Professor. yet. Thank you, Professor. Thank you so much. I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it there. Thank you to Professor Mwekezi Letsega, Senior Lecturer with UNICEF's Department of Education. And of course, in studio was Nikki Stein, an attorney with Section 27. Well, unfortunately, we've come to the end of uh, PM News for today. Do join us same time, same place tomorrow. That is right here on SABC News, Africa's news leader. For myself, Alicia Jolly, the entire crew and team, have yourself a lovely one. And good luck to all the matriculants.